Right, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, start by thanking Jeff Dickens and the people who've uh, arranged for me to come up and speak to you here in Leicestershire today. Now, I'd like to begin with just a few remarks, although I'm from the South, of course, about uh, certain national events that have occurred in quite close proximity to here. I shan't mention any names, um, and I shan't talk about any specifics, but I would like to say something about the uh, leaking of the list and its appearance on the internet only for a minute before I start. Uh, now, politics always uh, has a dubious side to it, but it's my experience that all of these things come about because of internal strife and dissension between people, much of which has nothing to do with politics at all. Nothing to do with philosophy, nothing to do with why political organisations are formed. It's because people grate against each other over time, particularly if they're involved in sort of constant activity. Politics has an impersonal side. If certain people are guilty of certain offences, I was on the advisory council, which is the party's ruling group, um, with them when some of these things were going on. All I would advise people is when our forebears did national service with each other, you don't necessarily like everybody, you don't necessarily have to go home afterwards with everybody, but you have to pursue a reasonable standard of civility and impersonality. And as long as you do that, everything will be fine. What tends to happen is that people fall out, they've got slightly authoritarian personalities, as right-wing people tend to, they tend to think that anything goes when they start brawling with each other, and things which they would have regarded as monstrous in terms of their personal behaviour, they then think they're entitled to do them because they've fallen out with various other unnamed persons. This leads to retribution of a similar sort, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And it can only be purged by a parting of the ways. People then end up, at the end of this travelogue, in a far worse state than they were in the beginning, and they feel that everything that they've done is morally... that they were morally entitled to do it, which is often the complete reverse. They would have been the first to condemn these sorts of antics had they come into it cold from the very beginning. So all I will say is always try and keep personalia and differences to an absolute minimum and behave as you would as if you were in the forces. And as long as that's the case, there shouldn't be these sorts of problems. And that's all I'll say about it. Now, what's been happening to our country just in, in the year and a bit since I probably came up to Leicestershire to speak to you all. Now, the credit crunch looms and the economy sinks and eight weeks ago much of the Western banking system almost collapsed, something which I never thought I'd see in my own lifetime. Yeah. The crash that could have occurred eight weeks ago and which in a slower way is gone going now is similar to the one in 1929-1930, although governmental responses to it are different because we're living in a different age and many of them have learned things from that era. In 29, when it crashed and large sections of the fiscal underpinning of Western societies just went down into the mire, millions were thrown out of work instantly. Unemployment went up to sort of 10 million in many Western societies, a 25% effectively unemployed, without much social welfare. The radical 30s and what they led to was the result of that sort of thing. Now, Western politicians have learned a trick or two since then. They've learned how to manage demand. They've learned a certain degree of Keynesian economics which kept Western societies and their economies together and on track to a degree until it looked very shock soiled by the 1970s when the model was beginning to fray at the edges and come apart. Thatcher came along in the 1980s and reversed the spectrum and went back to the sort of economic underpinnings that preceded the crash in 29, albeit in a different way because things never recur. Certain people who've been giving people nasty phone calls in relation to that list uh, accuse people on it of being various things, and one of the, one of the things that they say is uh, a word that begins with F, and is a political word. But the truth is, the radical types of politics, when they come back, like radical economic chaos, when it comes back, always comes back in a different way. No era is the same, and the crisis that we're going to face in the next couple of years, when an unemployment goes from 2 million at the end of this year, to 3 million on most establishment prerequisites by the end of next, to maybe five billion when you add in all the people who are effectively unemployed in a Western society, will be very, very severe. Whether it gets as deep and as dark and as nasty as the early 30s and thereafter remains to be seen, but it could well. Why has this occurred? It's occurred because the mainstream economy, which people work and save in, is now connected through international institutions 
to endless and extremely complicated games of roulette. Much of the economic wealth of the West since uh, the late 1980s is based on, it's based on extreme forms of gambling. What has occurred is a type of economics which has a sort of chaos-based element to it, a deconstructive element. Take this podium that I'm standing on. Somebody made this, somebody crafted it, somebody put some value into it, it was sold to this hall through the local authority for a certain price. This is the sort of economics that most people can understand. The sort of economics which has been going on in the City of London for the last quarter of a century is completely different to the economics that has produced this thing that I'm knocking at the moment. It would say that this has a price, if it was a stock or a share or a concept about money, and you can change its price into an idea about the price of the object. And once you have an idea of the price, you can sell and buy the nature of the price of the object. And you can bet on the price as it goes up, as you expect it to fall. There's a market, market in the City of London called the Grey Market, where people bet on the prospect of bets which may actually occur. And so what you're seeing is that money ceases to have any relationship with something that's physical, something that's been crafted, something that's been made, something that exists. Money becomes a concept that breeds itself. And people buy and sell concepts about money. These so-called shared derivatives, which has led to this crash, are concepts about money in relation to debt. Clinton introduced a law when he was president in his second term of his eight years when he was a centre-left American president of yesteryear. There was an attempt to give the American dream to a large number of persons of colour and a large number of poor whites in the United States. They could all take out a mortgage that they couldn't afford to repay if there was the slightest degree of a downturn, and they were prioritised in law. But somebody had the clever idea that this wasn't debt. No, it's not debt, because they had pledged to repay it. So you treat it as something that is actually equity because they pledged to repay it. And then you can build leverage buyouts. It's called you can build loans on the fact that they had not yet repaid it, but they were going to, and they were tied into a system where they were going to. And then you can bet on the fact that the values of these instruments might go up or might go down. And then you get a bit worried about them and you securitize them, which means banks swap them with each other. Now, a child would tell you that this is all rather dubious, <laughs> but this is what many, many people in the city of London, in Frankfurt, in uh, the Far East, and throughout the American markets have been doing for the last 8 to 12 to 15 years. And anyone who spoke against it was a reactionary, or a conservative, or not a happening person, or a person who was against their firm making money. And don't think that many of the security traders thought that when all this was going on, there wouldn't be a downturn, there wouldn't be a crash, they are sort of 30 second junkies. These are people who do a deal every 30 seconds, every minute and a half. Which uh, Rupert Murdoch once told somebody that he got actually depressed if he didn't make a business deal every three minutes. And this short attention span type of thinking, linked to this type of economics, has led to a situation where somebody I used to know was a Tory councillor in Westminster. When he was at Merrill Lynch, the average salary was 420,000 a year. <coughs> a year. They used to order champagne in 16 crates at a time. They would light Havana cigars, which you can't import to the United States because they have an embargo on communist Cuba. But the city of London would light them all the time and they would light them with £10 notes. This is what, it's, uh, what, it, what it was like in the 1980s and in the early 1990s. This sort of post Thatcherite bubble, Moji was premier then, of greed and cupidity and short sightedness and all the rest of it. 420,000. That's the average salary in Lehman's when it collapsed was 310,000. That's the average. A year. A year. Now, on that day's trading, the managers came onto the floor and they said, you're all out. You're all out in an hour, and you get three grand or less. There's no pension for any of you. You can keep your mobiles. You clear your desk, and they're out a half an hour later in the street, in the cold, with a box. And that's all they had. And that's what that type of capitalism is like. It's in and out, and you sell at the top, and if it goes crash, you get out and there's nothing. But there's not much sympathy for them, of course. But what they've left is an extraordinary mess of toxic debt in banks, including all our high street banks. People think it's just obscure city institutions with strange names that they haven't heard of before until they click onto CNN or BBC 24. Barclays is in debt less so than the others. NatWest Royal Bank of Scotland is heavily so. Lloyd's TSB, although they have actually scoovered up, other institutions are as well. 
They're writing off tens of billions, and that's what's on their own bank account. That's what's on their own balance sheet. You have to understand that most of this economics happened off the sheet. It's not actually in the accounts of the bank. That's why it's even more toxic. Now, Bush has spent two and a quarter trillion dollars to try and retrieve this. That's a trillion dollars, not a billion, a trillion dollars to try and retrieve this. Um, an enormous insurance group that couldn't be allowed to collapse because it was underwriting all of this. Laymans that went to the wall because they had to allow one to go to the wall to prove that it's still a capitalist system, not a safe state socialist one. Don't forget that ideology has now gone completely out of the window. Bush used to declare, Bush is into me. This is Bush too. Um, his father was head of the Central Intelligence Agency. They've been an establishment family in America since the very beginning. Forget all the texts and I'm running against the corrupt system in Washington. There was a Bush in Washington's army that fought against us 200 years ago and more. Bush is a village in Essex. It's where they come from originally. Now, he adopted state socialist ideas, which he spent his entire lifetime ridiculing and regarding as anathema. He actually intervened with ideas which are to the left of any democratic ca candidate for the presidency since the Second World War. Because when the system's crashing around you, and when it's on fire, you're not bothered whether it's a left-wing view or a right-wing view, you just need an extinguisher. And that's what's been happening. Now, the United States of America is on the point, I believe, of extraordinary decline. And we in this country have tied ourselves to the US. And we've tied ourselves since the Suez Crisis, if not before. Because although we quote-unquote won the Second World War, we emerged bankrupt and with a socialist government in charge between 1945 and 51, when Labour was old Labour. And when you go to Leicester now, and when you realise that we're in a minority in Leicester now, and when you realise that there is no aggregated community in Leicester now that is in the majority, this is all as a result of a law that the Labour government passed in 1948 called the Nationality Act. When Attlee, who was Churchill's deputy during the war, stood up in the House of Commons and said the races of the world need to be mixed together. They need to be mixed together because if they are, there will be no more war. No more war. This is the rhetoric of the anti-colonial movement from the 20s and 30s and before. It's the rhetoric of the radical left. It's the rhetoric of the left in the trade unions at that time. Now, many people thought and still think that Attlee was a good egg, that post-war Labour wasn't so bad, it's the new Labour that we don't like and that sort of thing. You will hear that on the doorstep many times. But this sort of rot began under them, and it began a long time ago. People noticed that their cities were changing. They noticed that Leicester was changing, certainly. Certainly by the early 60s, certainly. But even then, it was a trickle in relation to what has occurred. Um, England is 15% is non-white now. And in the cities, much, much more so. Two million people have left London in the last quarter of a century. There are largely white British people who sort of, quote-unquote, fled into the hinterland around London. And this sort of economic chaos that we're seeing the more than the beginnings of now, and this type of migration of peoples, are all interlinked. Because if you have an international system, and increasingly since the war we've been plugged in to an international system, so there were some plugs in this room. And before, people used to have rather self-sufficient ways of doing things, up to a point, up to a point, even though we've always been a trading and a maritime nation. But now, old Labour, never mind new Labour, and the Conservatives since the war, if not before, have plugged us in to international structures. And if capital goes around the world, and capital is bought and sold as an idea, and if a lad in the city of London, or in an exchange in Leeds, it's Northern equivalent, puts his thumb on a screen, and 20 million goes to another exchange, just because he's put his thumb on a particular square of a computer screen, labour moves just like the money moves. Capital moves around the world, labour moves around the world. Immigration is labour. Labour is immigration. So these systems of money and people, man and measures, money and people, men and coins and currencies and credit move around the world, all around the world. The immigrants who come in have come in to work, but they've also come in through other mechanisms, because the mechanisms through which they've come in differ. Some have come in as refugees, some have come in as economic migrants, some have come in as illegals, some have had a right to settle because post-imperial treaties, and so on. In the early 1970s, a large number of Asians in Uganda became, and elsewhere, Kenya and so on, became the victims of nationalism. Various dictators whose economies were going to pieces and so on. The Asians ran the shops. They provided a lot of the credit. They didn't like the look of them. So they played populism with their own tribes and they had to be carted out. 
Didn't want really to go back to the Asian subcontinent then, although probably if the situation occurred now, a proportion of them, given the bourgeois opportunities in India, and to a lesser extent Pakistan and Bangladesh, would do so. But Heath allowed them in here. That was an exception. Thatcher in 79, when she made a few radical remarks, which got her into quite a lot of trouble with the international set, but which were deliberately designed to undercut the National Front vote at that time, which she needed to undercut in 79, but not thereafter. She said there'd be no more primary immigration, but of course 50,000 Hong Kong Chinese passports, or passports for those sorts of people in Hong Kong, before it was handed back to Communist China, were distributed. The irony is most of them didn't want to come here, they wanted to go straight to the United States. Now, just as we've yoked ourselves to the United States since the Second World War, we could face an extraordinary decline, because we've got no independence of judgment at all. The only people in our establishment who don't want to go with America on everything are those who want to go with the European Union on everything. And most of them actually balance between the two, because they think this country is finished, and we've got to have a powerful friend, or a group of mates, or a gang. And if we don't have the US, we have Europe. But as Blair said, it's best to be with both at one and the same time. Blair's always on everyone's side, if you remember. He came in in 97. He tells you what you want to hear him say. Working class audience is one line. Immigrant audience is another line. Middle class audience in the south of England or elsewhere. It's another line. Because he was an actor. He's a political actor and a pathological liar. Yeah. He yeah. can actually argue for two points of view. <laughs> and that's his training. He was trained in employment law. You actually go around one side of the table and you argue for your client, and you go around the other side of the table and argue against, and you split the difference. And that's his attitude. He's in favour of nuclear weapons, he's against them. He's in favour of abortion, he's against it. He's in favour of immigration, and at times uh, it's British jobs for British workers, a slogan from the National Front, which Brown now trundles out, and Cameron has now accused him of xenophobia. We're using that sort of a slogan, because as many people have realised, the old class-based allegiances where it's Tory and Labour and it's really vicious and it's red or it's blue, depending on your background or the region of the country you come from, that's all over. They were all merged into each other to the degree that we have a sort of one-party rule, but we can change the sort of seating arrangements every four years. And this is what it is. And you notice the phenomenon whereby they all run against what they're supposed to stand for. Centre-right politicians have red ties. And centre-left politicians have blue ties. And centre-left politicians say how, like Mandelson, for example, or Lord Mandelson, inverted columns, Lord Mandelson, as we should call him, they know gone about how much they are. And how the market, these are quote-unquote socialists, don't forget, the market will cure everything. Cameron says he's not really a Tory leader, he's not really a Conservative at all, and he slightly despises the Conservatives. He's really an upper-class liberal who's above party. And increasingly, they become interchangeable. <laughs> One up against another. Skinner and these people out on the back benches are sets of dinosaurs of yesteryear because their front benches are swapping over all the time. And on all of the core issues, membership of the European Union, support of American foreign policy, support of Israel, involvement in the Iraq war, mass migration into this country and other Western European societies, all based on the American precedent, and so on, they all agree. They all agree there's nothing about which, apart from a few minor matters, they really disagree. The Liberals never get in, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's leader either, it's collect now, it could have been an old chap uh, called Menis Campbell a while back, and all the rest of it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that the Liberals don't technically get in, although at other levels of government they do, of course, because their ideas are in power. Liberal ideas dominate the ideology of the main two parties to such a degree that you can almost consider Tory Labour as firms now, as sort of um, franchises. The Liberals give them their ideas, and they're essentially different view versions of each other, different groups of bourgeois people who've split about and who sort of swap over every four or five years. Gradually, English and British people have begun to realise that they're ruled by a group, by a set, that these parties don't really matter. That when you go on the doorstep and people say, I've been Labour all my life, mate. <laughs> Labour all my life. A chap once said to me, Labour. I was Labour, my father was Labour, his father was Labour. I said, hold oh, on, he wouldn't have had the vote, you know. Oh, well, he would have been Labour anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me open and it's red, red, mind you, I'm not a communist. <laughs> but it's Labour, 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 Labour. And uh, it's the same the other way around, you know. I once knocked on a very posh Tory woman's door in Essex. You knew she was a Tory. 
she handed you the leaflet back. She had pearls on it. <laughs> and she handed you the leaflet back and said, oh no. <laughs> so, so, not at all. And she said, are you with them? And I said, yes. And she went, oh. <laughs> no. No. Door, so, yeah. that, uh, that same afternoon, uh, it's a funny afternoon, there's an area called Hornchurch where there is now a BNP councillor because, of course, in that part of Essex, the East End has moved down. The East End of the old East End of London, and the old Cockney East End has moved out. Why have they moved out? They've moved out because of the extraordinary and almost revolutionary demographic changes which have occurred in our capital city and in Birmingham and in Leicester just to a smaller and yet even more radical degree in the last 30 to 40 years. That's where the East End has gone. They've gone up into Essex. But you do get them all on the door. Now, on that afternoon, the first uh, door, this old lady answered, and before I could almost get the leaflet out, she was screaming Nazi. She screamed, <laughs> Nazi! She screamed, and then she ran across the road to talk to her mate. But you could see that English look in her eyes, oh no, she's coming, you know. And her little old friend tried to get away, but she cornered her, saying, the Nazis are here, the Nazis are here. And I said, look, can I put you down as a possible? <laughs> <laughs> Butler, uh, the National Elected Officer, says it's Y, yes, N, no, not at all, and P, possible, or they're not in or something. Yeah? And, uh, but of course you get the other reaction as well. People bring their entire families out and want to shake hands with you and all the rest of it. But there's a problem even with that because of course that slows you down really and in a way it's nice. But that's not what electioneering is about, I'm afraid. And then you find that all these people are all over you, of course, aren't even on the register. And they can't vote anyway. Because they're, they're attempting to avoid council tax. All of nonsense, because they know where they are anyway. So, you know, this, well, you know it's, it's one thing after another, isn't it? But um, I think it's quite palpable that uh, certainly a large number of white working class people have woken up to the reality of New Labour. Which is why, in some ways, they're worried. When a group of Liverpudlian activists were arrested recently for just handing out national leaflets, that is because Labour is in radical decline in their own rotten boroughs, in their own areas where they, the Tories never go. There's parts of this country, Newcastle, the North East, the, the sort of Merseyside, parts of the industrial north, parts to a slightly lesser extent but still powerful of the post-industrial Midlands, the Strathclyde Belt in Scotland, South Wales, where Tories don't exist. You know, it's a couple of old ladies having a coffee morning. They, they, the right, if you like, of the centre doesn't exist. Labour in parts of Cumbria has stood in certain areas without opposition for 40 years. Mm. These are rotten boroughs. These are sort of like sort of third world sort of scenarios, 18th century scenarios in our past. Labour's so used to ruling in these areas that when they're challenged by a sort of, if you like, a right-wing party that masses that working class people can vote for, they, they don't. It's not that they don't like it is they hate and detest it to a degree which is extraordinary. And when people are arrested, it is largely because elements of the police have been politicised in those areas by cronies of theirs in the Labour Party. Um, these arrests have often occurred in core areas, in core Labour areas, Swansea. You know, the valleys are ours, they're ours. These areas have never voted anything but Labour since 1900. And that was when the Labour Party was set up by the Representation Committee on behalf of the trade unions who financed them since that day. These are their areas, and they're going to get very dirty if these areas are taken away from them. You know, they wouldn't go to these links if it was the Tories, even though they say that they hate them as well. It's because it's the radical right. It's because it's to the people, are, in a sense, to the right of the Conservatives, sometimes by quite a long way, sometimes by less. But they're the range of opinion they detest more than anything else, and they will fight tooth and nail for these sorts of areas. And that's what a lot of these naughties and nasties are actually about. It's Labour in its partial death throes in some of their core areas thrashing about. Hazel Blears, the Minister for Communities, said a couple of weeks ago that the British National Party is a great danger and white right working class people in particular are looking at it as an alternative. She means an alternative to us. Brown's Queen speech the other day had hardly any bills in it at all. This means he's preparing to go to the country at any time between now and 2010. He will go and say it's chaos, it's uncertain, I've been in charge for 11 years, but trust me to make more of a mess of it, because you don't know what Cameron will do, and he will trade on that. Just as when uh, Western people are in an odd situation, they despise their politicians, they blackguard, blackguard them all the time, they're sort of um, 
sort of shows on the television whereby the politicians and the political class are held in such contempt that even if you hinted at that in some third world societies, you'd be executed if you described your social and political leaders in that sort of a way. And yet simultaneously with this, many of our people will cling on to these people that they hate and despise because they're in a worrisome state. People are sort of depressed. But when you're depressed, why not become manically so and cling on to nurse for fear of something worse? So paradoxically, when America was attacked by Islamist extremists in uh, 2001, Bush's rating soared. Similarly, Brown, who looked down and out, now that people are worried, now that the house relatives of mine live in is worth about a quarter to a third less than it was a year ago, many of them are thinking, oh, well, we'll just cling on to Brown because at least he's riding the tiger. Because many of our people are bereft, in a way, because the society has changed out of all recognition in relation to what they really want. And they wonder why it's occurred. And they've been left leaderless because we have a political class that's disassociated itself from the bulk of English and British people. They've gone off somewhere else. They're in an international set of their own. If you notice how much of the news is dominated by what's going on in other countries, starvation and cholera in Zimbabwe, a once successful white-ruled country, of course, which had the highest standard of living in southern Africa. Now there is no bread, and any loaves that remain cost a million Zimbabwean dollars. And he's getting, Mugabe's dictatorship is in trouble because he can't pay the military anymore. And that is the moment, that's the tipping point when the soldiers, the thugs he, the shaman thugs he has to keep control can't be paid. That's the moment. Uh, but that country's a basket case, an utter basket case. But when we ruled it, Yes, when we ruled it, through a sort of uh, ex-English hero called Ian Smith, when we ruled it, it was run efficaciously and well. And the Africans were well treated. But there was no talk of equality, because we didn't believe in all that nonsense then. But we've changed, and we've declined quite a bit since then. It's very evident with Conservatives. Conservatives laughed at the left for 40 to 50 years. Lesbian marriage, what a hoot, eh? Hilarious, you know then it becomes a reality. Then saying that you don't agree with it in too forceful a manner becomes illegal. And they stare at their televisions, wondering what's happened to this entire society. Islamist doctors blow themselves up in the outside Glaswegian airports. You know, because they are concerned about our involvement in foreign wars dictated by the United States. Our people sit watching this on the television, sort of wondering what's going on. They think it's some film, they put the DVD in, wake up soon. But this is what has happened in our country over the last 50 to 60 years. Because one thing has led to another, has led to another. If the National Front, when it was a realistic organisation, had broken through in the 1970s, maybe some of these tendencies would have been arrested or would have been slow. But in many ways, you're talking about slowing. The response to Enoch Powell when he spoke in the Midlands uh, in 1968-9 was enormous. One million letters, because people used to write to their MPs then, they thought it would make a difference, you know. Um, one million in favour, nine against. One of the nine abusive, as Powell said. That was the response of England and Britain then. That's why he had a mass following amongst working class people for a Tory centre-right politician. Hitherto unheard of, certainly in a post-war scenario. People don't remember Enoch, although he was a great man on all sorts of fronts for his economic policy or his later Ulster unionism. Remember him a bit more for his opposition to the European Union or the European community as it then was in one of its earlier incarnatory stages because it morphs over time. The new American president, yes, the new American president elect, says he doesn't like uh, the EU in its present form. He's in the, he's, um, some of his spokesmen have indicated they would like to deal with the European state. He said the other week, I'm fed up, we're talking to 27 countries, I want to talk to one. And that means America is looking to have a USE, one currency, United States of Europe, one currency, so you can have two blocks on either side of the Atlantic against the pro trouble that's looming as they proceed it from Russia, from Iran, that will have nuclear weapons within 18 months, um, from the new China, from the new India, and of course from the Islamic world. Now... America has elected its first non-white president in its history. I mentioned Bush earlier, and he's, from a, he's descended from a village in Essex. <coughs> Whites will be a minority in the United States before too long. The Kennedys in the 1960s, remember all that Marilyn Monroe and all the drugs and the orgies and what alleged fun they had? That's all unimportant. 
The important thing about the Kennedys is they reversed the all-white immigration policy into the United States, which had been outstanding and upstanding since the early 1920s. Since then, 70 million, that's right, 70 million persons of colour have entered the United States. The United States has changed out of all recognition. A third of America is non-white now. And whites are in minorities in most of the cities. So this idea that it's an extension of Europe, that the sort of John Wayne's America is still up and around, except on old videos, isn't true. Isn't true at all. Obama's been elected because a third of the society resembles him and looks to him to look after their interests. 70% of whites didn't vote for him. An interesting statistic, but 30% did. Because amongst our own people, liberalism is semi-endemic. Always seeing the other chap's point of view, always wanting to be fair, never having a tribal or a communitarian attitude of their own, avoiding anything that could smack of them. Dear, 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 no, no, no. And if ever our people think as variously illicit thoughts, there's a doctrine called political correctness, which brings them back to the true <laughs> path, allegedly, yeah, yeah. so that they, even if they have a thought, a thought, <laughs> they don't even speak it, but they have a thought, this sort of spy that comes out of the box and says, no, no, you're being incorrect, my friend. And it's sort of, people look behind them, even when they're with their mates. <laughs> no one around them so that they can come out with an incorrect, verbalised thought. And people are tyrannised in this way. But that's because they're self-policing. Don't need a secret police, don't need, like the Stasi, some dissident would go down the shops. There'd be eight of them in one of those little tranny cars. The West Eastern equivalent of a disabled car that the Soviet-style secret police used to zip around in in their leather jackets and all this, you know, before the wall came down. There'd be eight following some dissident musician to the shop where you can buy one type of cheese and one type of sausage and something, and then you'd come back again. Don't need this in Western societies. People police themselves by thinking this thought that I've had is incorrect and I shouldn't speak it. I certainly shouldn't speak it at work. No, no, no. Um, I, saw an offer, I saw a prison officer's entry form to enter into the civil service, to enter into <coughs> being a prison officer. The lowest rung of entering into a prison officer. He had to sign this form saying, I hereby certify that I will not discriminate against any person, prisoner or not, on grounds of race, ethnicity, class, gender, intellectual capacity, sexuality, transsexuality, <laughs> disability, and it went on and on and on for a whole paragraph. Of course, most people don't even read this. They just sign it at the bottom, don't they? You know, it's just a job. And that sort of thing. But what they don't realise is they're signing up to all of this. Because it's a system. It's a system. It's a viewpoint. It's been imposed. It stems from the cultural revolutions of the 1960s. The generation that's imposed it, the Greg Dyke generation when he was head of the BBC, the Tony Blair uh, sort of generation when he was Premier, Brown's a sort of slightly old Labour relic. Blair is the real one. Blair is the real instigator of what exists now. But much of what they put forward was actually coming under the Tories, but in a slower, more broken down, slightly more reserved, dare one say slightly more English way. The Tories have had many chances to reverse the role since 1948 and the Nationality Act that I uh, mentioned earlier. They've been in government in the 70s through 74. I was born in 1962, although of course looked much younger. But there's a degree to which the Tories were in power up till 64. They're in power in this great swathe of power under Thatcher and Major from 79 to 97. And virtually they've done nothing to reverse the leftwards drift that Labour and with their liberal ideas of increasing radicalism have put forward. Between 45 and 51, between 64 and 70, between 74 and 79, and now between 97 and the year that we're in now, the tail end of 2008. And Brown hopes to extend it for another four or five. But it'll be no different if Cameron gets in. Because what we need is a clear out. We need a removal of the present establishment. They had their day, they failed in all sorts of ways, they're increasingly unpatriotic to a degree which is embarrassingly obvious even to themselves. They're loyal to international and transnational institutions and structures that have little to do with us. And there needs to be a clearing out of these sorts of people. And the only way that it can be done is through electoral politics, such as the European Union elections which are coming up next time. And let's hope that all the usual questions that people say, oh, you can't win, I do agree with you, but I've got to protect my job as if, if voting's going to affect that, you know. There's always UKIP, 
In any case, um, I don't like European elections, why should I vote in them? You don't stand everywhere, um, you won't win a seat if you can, and, uh, and so on the rest of it. All of these are false, because the, this party is standing everywhere, in every region, in every nationality of the United Kingdom. There's a, without going into the rather tedious details of it, there are, there's proportionality in these elections. This means that every vote matters, every vote matters, it doesn't go in the bin at the side, because it's proportionate. Therefore, if you vote British National Party, it has an effect. And if you go into work the day after and say, I voted for the British National Party, it will be much less of a shock than in the past. Because everybody knows who you are after those lists were published anyway. <laughs> when those logs, that log went up, people couldn't get on it. Because so many people were trying to get on that blog, it crashed all the time, like computers 20 years ago. So in a strange way, whatever the motivations, personal bile, revenge, internal disputes manifested externally, hostility from without in any sense, whatever the motivations of whomsoever was behind all of that, in a way, it will always backfire. Because when people are fired on from without, they will resist from within. When you put a bit of pressure on English and British people from without, they usually respond to that in a more courageous and sort of noble-hearted way. My understanding is that since these revelations, 30 people have left the party um, nationally. And uh, a couple of week, a week or two back, a regional organiser in the south of England told me that 100 have joined. In other words, there's no change. So whatever was posited by that event, and these people ringing up you know, within a Birmingham accent saying, I'm going to do something terrible to you, and clunk, the fun goes down, because their hand's shaking when they're ringing the numbers. <laughs> because we make them nervous, you see. We're making them nervous. And why are they nervous? They're nervous because they are, in a small little way in their own lives, the legacy of the failures of 1945 and thereafter. Labour, Tory, using liberal ideas. This era has come to an end. Hopefully the generation that sponsored, not everyone obviously, but the generation that sponsored those sorts of an idea, those sorts of ideas, is itself leading the institutions of power. People say the young are totally indoctrinated in liberal ideas and will never change now. Well, let's see. And let's see what these sudden, jolt, sudden jolts of economic chaos that are ricocheting around our own island and the rest of the world do to people and their expectations of what they want in the future. I'll close by saying this. Now, there is only really one political organisation that can change this society, that can take this country back, that it can, in a different and future way, base this country upon the values it once held. You can never go back, but you can bring what was in the past forwards to have a new dispensation in the present. So I ask you, in relation to the run-up to the European elections and wrap-around local elections, and also in relation to the possibility of a sudden national poll, that Brown, in his desperation, may spring upon the country at any time between now and the middle of 2010. To leaflet for this organisation, to canvass for this organisation, to stand for this organisation, they know where you are anyway, given that blog, to raise money for this organisation, for in the future come up to the front to give a short speech on behalf of your local area in relation to this organisation, to attend events such as this, to attend other fundraising and social events, and to do what you can for the future of this part of the Midlands. Because England will always exist, even though our people are now in a minority in Leicester. We are still here. We are still there. We are still everywhere. There's over 150 million people of British descent. Our diaspora, although we've never seen it in those terms, elsewhere in the world. In North America, in Southern Africa still, in other parts of the world, in Australasia. We are still here. We are still English. We are still British. We are still fighting. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I Jonathan, are, are you standing in the European election? Yes, I hope so. That's a short question. You know, but it's interesting that this was a position that was completely unacceptable. Unacceptable to the establishment, unacceptable to the church, unacceptable to the BBC, unacceptable in academic life. It's now the majority viewpoint. <coughs> It'd be interesting to notice how other issues of a slightly more radical sort begin to come in from the fringe. So I think there will be an attempt, maybe if there is a Lib Lab pack next time and the Tories don't get in, there will be an attempt to get us into the Euro to mass alternate your last time. Um, I 
otherwise I don't think it will occur. The Tories are carrying too much sceptic baggage internally. And Cameron comes remarkably from the more sceptical wing of the party. Um, that younger generation of Tories, some of whom I know very well, although many of them were dead. We rather... No, no, that was just a stunt. We didn't really mean that. Of course people have a right to vote. No, in European democracies, of course. And of course it's very important that the Irish, who've taken an enormous amount of money from the EU,